We're with the man of the hour, Samuel Isaiah. He's one of the 10 finalists for the 2020 Global Teacher Prize and stands to win 1 million US dollars. You could be a very rich teacher by the end of next month, <laughs> won't you, Samuel? Thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be on your radio station to speak to you guys. Uh, I listen to you guys a lot. So this is a great experience for me. It's an honor for us to speak to you, actually. <laughs> thank you, JD. Appreciate it. Congratulations. I don't think I've said that yet. So congratulations <laughs> um, on being named a finalist in this uh, Global Teacher Award. Uh, so initially, what prompted you to want to take part in this contest? Well, uh, first of all, let me clear some speculations. If I do win the million dollars, it's not, it's not <laughs> going to be for me. Uh, I, I don't get to pocket it. As, uh, so uh, part of the application for the Global Teacher Prize, uh, they look at um, you know your classroom practices, uh, what you practice in school, what kind of significant impact have you done with the school, with the community over the years, um, what kind of values in teaching you produce. But most importantly, what they, they would want to know is what would you do with the $1 million? Mm. So uh, fortunately for me, uh, doing something for the Indigenous community that I've worked with for eight years is it's not something that I thought about yesterday. You know, uh, I mean, I had a plan brewing and uh, in time, it developed into something. So I think uh, the Global Teacher Prize was uh, was coming. You know, I had the application ready. I had my ideas ready. I just needed to, to put it in. Um, so how do I feel? Well, uh, first of all, I'm very humbled uh, and I'm very grateful for this recognition. I think um, it signifies two important things that I think a lot of us Malaysians take for granted. First of all, we have great teachers in Malaysia. Uh, we do, um, we do. Malaysian teachers have actually been part of this competition, um, at least making it to the top 50 for five years in a row, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. And uh, we have shown consistently that we are up there with good teachers uh, across the globe. And secondly, I think uh, this award and this recognition is not about me, it's not about Samuel Isaiah. It's actually the main heroes of this narrative, of this whole experience, is the community, is the indigenous community, Orangasli community, and specifically my children. I believe it's time we shine the light on their capabilities of how amazing they are, because throughout the years, we only hear negative things about Orangasli children. And um, in fact, that was one of the first things I heard when I stepped in into the school back in 2012. From whom? From <laughs> the people in the school. <laughs> yep. Yeah, from the people in the school. And um, I mean, if, if you look at research literature, uh, the stigma and the negative perceptions that surround or cloud the Orang Asli has been there for a long time. Uh, they, we assume that um, they don't like education. We assume that they're not good enough. We assume that, uh, and it was implied to me very early on that, um, that I did not have to push myself. I did not have to do so much because at the end of the day, they were not going to get it anyway. So that was the environment that I was put in. And unfortunately, the children themselves believe these stigmas. And I think that was my biggest challenge. Uh, a lot of people have spoken to me and asked me, you know, what are the biggest challenges in uh, Orang Asli schools? And uh, I, mean, I mean, your first guess would either be poverty, you know, or uh, the lack of accessibility and infrastructure. But these areas have been improving throughout the years. But... For me personally, as an educator, it was this stigma and this psychological barrier that I had to overcome with the children. Mm. All right. Now back to the prize, right? Back to the Global Teacher Prize. I read that you had to write 10 essays in right. two days to enter this competition. <laughs> I'm actually quite curious what kind of essays did the organizers ask from you? Okay, so um, the reason why I had to do it in two days because it was because I applied kind of at the very last minute. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, at the very last minute. Uh, I, my view towards education and my view to what I've been doing throughout the years has not been focused on professional development or myself. You know? I always viewed it as my job. And my job is to do the best that I can for the children that I serve, for the community that I serve. So that was my only intention. And, and the Global Teacher Prize has have been around for quite some time and I've never applied once. 
And so uh, my mentor, who used to be my lecturer back in Teachers College in Penang Island, uh, she told me, hey, Sam, why don't you apply for this? And I told her, you know what, ma'am, I don't think this is for me. I'm not the kind of a person who wants to go for record recognition, you know. And I also said, you know, what would people think? You know, what would people say? And she told me this. She said that, you know, everybody's, everyone, you know, Everybody's going to question your intentions. Mm. Whether they are right or they're wrong, only you know, only I know because we know each other really yeah. well. So if you're going to do it, do it for the right reasons. And she told me what the right reason was. She said the right reason was this will provide you with a pro platform to put your children's capabilities at an international light. It will show the world, not just Malaysians, it will show the world that, hey, that with the right techniques, with the right infrastructure, with the right policies, you know, helping them at home, helping the community and great teaching in the classroom, they can achieve great things as well. So the 10 essays, I did it in two days because I, I took some time thinking about it. Should I apply? Should I not? Should I apply? Should I not? And I eventually did. And the 10 essays were basically about what I've been doing for all the years, what were my teaching philosophies, um, uh, what I plan to do if I did win the money, uh, and uh, some of the projects I've done. So, and they also wanted me to include some of uh, some evidence uh, of which I'm very grateful to the Performance and Development Unit of the Ministry of Education Malaysia because uh, they kind of like spotted me a few years ago, three or four years ago, right. and they saw what I was doing with the children. So they came over to my classroom and uh, my school and they recorded a few videos of me. So I used that videos and sent it to the uh, Global Teacher Prize. And, the, yeah, the, the, the one, one where you're playing the guitar and, and the, the tab. The and outdoor, music. outdoor. Yep. The poko, the Skola Poco one, is it? Yep, the Skola right, Poco right, and okay. also the ukuleles. Right. Okay. But but you were talking about te uh, teaching philosophy. I'm curious to know what is your teaching philosophy? Well, before I joined the school, I had a very different philosophy. Um, I had this very Asian mentality. A not Asian, like Asian minority mentality. Where you, know, you go to school, uh, you need to do really well in your exams. And yeah. after you get, get done with your exams, you, know, you progress in your professional career that way. So I was kind of brought up that way. Uh, my parents always emphasized that I did well in school. So when I was in high school, I was a I was okay student. I did really well, you know, UPSR, straight A's, PMR, and wow. all that. But I didn't do so well for SPM though, because I was going through a rebellious stage. I think <laughs> when I was sixteen, I started uh, falling in love with music, with arts, uh, with uh, uh, you know, reading novels, reading Shakespeare, and uh, I loved history and all that. So that's I, your I went... rebelling. <laughs> it's weird, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess because. Uh... Rebel against your parents the, who want you to yeah. be a professional as right, a right, doctor, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. lawyer. They wanted me to do, right? you know, do science. So I hated science. I hated math. I could do it, but I just didn't like it, you know. Mm. Uh, so when I finished high school and all that, and after going to teacher's college, I, I had this vision of myself. You know what? I'm going to make the best of my career uh, since I'm already in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my master's as quickly as possible. And by the time I'm 30, I'm going to get my PhD and I'm going to go to like a university and be a professor right away. And then reality kind of like slapped me across my face and placed me in an honestly school, mm. which was very far away for you from a university. Uh, there was... There was no way, you know, back then, there was no way that I could do it online or anything, you know. I can't travel. I think uh, Kuala Lumpur was the nearest university that had uh, my courses available. Uh, that was like, what, 500 kilometers away. So that was not possible. And if I were to do it, I had to travel and all that. So I was actually quite down the first few months when I stepped into school. And this is a combination of a few things, you know. I saw that my whole hope, that my hopes and dreams of doing, making something of myself going down the drain and then I was sent to this school who did not even appear on the GPS back then. I tried wow. looking for it Yeah, right. back in 2012. Right now we have it. We have better accessibility. Uh, we can drive cars on the inside. It's not a problem. Uh, so back then, couldn't find it on the GPS. Uh, you know, and everything was just falling apart mm. until I met the children, um, until I developed a relationship with the children and they taught me what education really meant that my philosophy of actually, you know, learning... Passing exams and exactly, scoring well. Com completely different. And then as I studied the 
uh, research literature of the indigenous people, I realized that their view of life and their view of education is very interconnected. It's interconnected to their social life as well. To them, they see learning as something that is, that is collaborative and cooperative instead of competitive. You see, it's a completely mm-hmm. different shift of yeah. everything. And they learn from the experience. And so when I started getting close to them, I started uh, opening my eyes to what they were doing. I dived into the community and their culture. I listened to them. Uh, they rubbed off on me. And I would say, I would firmly say that they changed my perspectives. They changed who I am. And that actually gave birth to all my other interventions throughout the, year, throughout, throughout the years of what I did with them. Wow. Okay. But when did you know that you wanted to become a teacher? I never knew that I wanted to become a teacher. <laughs> really? <laughs> what did you want to become? This is not then? this is not a fairy tale story of a guy <laughs> no, no, no. who that dreamt is, of becoming a teacher no, and then no. became one. Nope. <laughs> no. There's nobody in my closest family, uh, you know, like my relatives, none of us are teachers. So like I said, it was a weird rebellious state, <laughs> JD. And, uh, I think it was the closest to uh, to language and arts that I like. So I, I was like, you know, why not? If not, my parents were just going to force me to do STPM anyway. So might as well take this opportunity and do it. So even when I was in teacher's college and then in university, though they taught me the theories, the concepts, the foundations of teaching and learning, the assessment, the curriculum, how do I design things for, for students? They, they gave me the basics really well, but I didn't find my passion. Really? I, yep. I did not find my passion. I and that is why the my first the first uh, plan or the first dream that I had after I finished my degree was to quickly get out of school, mm. you know, do my masters and PhD instead of you know I'm going to change lives and all that. It, it never dawned on to me that that was what I was going to do until I met the kids. I basically fell in love with them and the community. So you fell into teaching in a way, and then you fell in love with teaching when you met the kids. Right. 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 Yeah. I, Go ahead. So oh, yeah, I was about to say that, you know, I think I embraced them. They embraced me first before I embraced them. They gave me a chance first. You know, I was this tall Indian guy coming from somewhere that, that they've never seen before. Um uh, with a different perspective. Uh, you know, I was very close to the kids. The kids are very much like my children. Um I feel like a celebrity every morning when I come to the school, you know, uh, because <laughs> because we once I park my car and then I walk through classes that I don't even teach, the kids will run out, high fives, okay, you know, hugs, hi sir, bye sir, and by the time I get to the office to punch card, it will probably take me about 10 minutes, even though it's just like <laughs> what, 20, 30 minutes, uh, 20, 30 meters away. So, Every day was a joy to be at that school. Um, and I've also said this before that whatever sacrifices that I've made um, with them and for them, I never saw it as a sacrifice. I think if it's something that you love doing, it's not a sacrifice, it's, it's a blessing. Yeah. Did that connection start from the get-go with your children or did it take a while? It took a while. Uh, mainly because they were not used to a teacher who wanted to listen to them, who wanted mm. to get to know mm. them. Uh, there was always a distance. I think this is common in many schools uh, where teachers, uh, it's, it, it depends on their preference. You know, S- Certain teachers like to, like to maintain a distance. Yeah. I'm the teacher. I'm the one in power. You listen to me. The more the classroom is like a prison, the better. Where everybody just sits there. Mm. You, know, you go to eat, you light up. Before you sit, you light up. It's exactly like a prison. Everyone's in uniform, except it's white, not orange. So right, right. <laughs> for me, I believe uh, in very, very different things. I believe that teaching is more than just teaching a particular subject. It's about creating relationships and touching lives. Okay. Has your enthusiasm rubbed off on the other teachers in the school? Uh, can I not answer that? Oh, touchy <laughs> subject. Okay, yeah, I was about to go. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I think I think I think yeah. uh, I think I could answer that. Uh, but uh, I think it's a choice. Eventually, yeah. it's a choice. You know, in in whatever career that you're in, you know, if you're not passionate about it, but if if you're still passionate, you always look about look for the easiest way to do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the easiest way to teach would actually qualify anybody to be a teacher. You know, take a book, make some photocopies, give the kids to answer the questions. When you're done, we're going to check the answers together. Yay, teaching. And that is why a lot of times uh, teachers teach, but students don't learn. 
Mm. So that's a big difference for, uh, from from uh, from that perspective and example that I gave. So I'll Samuel, take that as a yeah. no. Okay. <laughs> Now, Sam, Sam, do you think do you think if you were sent to another school, maybe not this school, your teaching philosophy would have been different? Your perspective on teaching would have been different? I actually asked myself this question a few mm. years ago. It's like, what if this did not happen? You were sent to like a a, a city school. City, yeah, right, yeah. Right. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I, I, I. Because I think people in urban urban uh, schools, uh, teachers in urban schools actually face a different set of challenges. The expectations is a lot on these teachers. They are people always watch them. You know, JD, if someone keeps on watching you when you're going to make a mistake, how comfortable would that make you feel? I do. Yeah, that happens every day. <laughs> he, he, oh, really? used, he used to be a lecturer, so I'm sure ah, he knows. All right, yeah. all right. Yeah. Right, so I, th- I think urban teachers. I mean, uh, with with uh, teachers in urban schools with parents or professionals, or there's a different kind of challenge that they face. You know, the I don't know if I started teaching my ki- uh, kids in urban schools the ukulele and because this is uh, this is what I call experiential learning. I give the students a meaningful purpose to use the language because I believe English is a language first, a subject second. Mm. So they need to use it. They need to communicate. Especially with children who have no exposure to the English language at all, so I used music. The instructions that I taught them was in English, so they know the the parts of the ukulele in English. They know the instructions to play it in English, and they sing English songs as well. So I used that. But if I were to use this, probably if I were to use this in Kuala Lumpur, a parent would just come to me the next day and say, "Are you teaching my kids to have fun, or you're teaching them to learn?" You see, yeah, yeah, it's a different, yeah, it's a yeah, different, yeah. It's a diff- different expectation. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I had a lot of support, uh, mostly from the community, because um, they were patient with me. Because number one, in indigenous schools, uh, around Asli schools, no matter where they are, even in schools in Sungai Dua, Karak, that's very close to Kuala Lumpur, or the one in Selangor, in Gomba, for example, school attendance and dropout rates are really, really high. Uh, mainly because from what I've read and what I've experienced myself. It's that the school experience is not meaningful to them at all. It does not relate to their lives. Uh, it does not relate to their dreams. It does not relate to almost anything to their culture, especially. So I tried to make that happen for my kids. So when the parents saw that the kids in my classroom really liked to come and wanted to come because they loved to learn, they were supportive. And uh, I think that is a uh, that that's one of the, our biggest accomplishments, you know, to get the kids to come to school because they wanted to learn, not because anybody was forcing them to. I think when we were kids, you know, let's say when we were ten year old, we you hated that particular teacher, and you told your dad, "Dad, I don't want to go to school today." Your father would just you know rotta you or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> there's no choice. But for orang asli kids, if they don't like it, most of the time they, they just don't come to school. And this also got to do with culture. For the jakun that I teach. Um, there's this adat. It's called adat sayyid. So what adat sayyid means? They don't believe that they they should force their children. Mm. Very interesting perspective. They give their children autonomy, but autonomy when it's directed to to the right path is just going to be really awesome. And I think I tapped into that as well. Yeah. Right. So, but if the kids don't want to come to school, it's like you know don't want to come to school. Lah. That's it. No excuse. No reason. Okay. So, so did from your experience teaching these kids, you came up with different interesting methods of helping them learn, like playing the ukulele, and like you you set up this pen pals for them as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So, first of all, I I think when I started the school in in the school in 2012, I took some time to adapt to everything. You know, the the environment, the the culture of the school at the time, the expectations. And I actually and, read that you wanted to quit in the beginning. Yep. Was that true? Yep. Because if you put all the pieces together, you know, Mr. Sam, who is like very uh, career-oriented guy, wants to be a professor along the way, you know, suddenly gets through. It it makes a lot of sense to quit. And uh, at that time, yes, I, I really wanted to quit until the kids. Uh, so I experimented a lot initially. I wanted to find the best fit for my kids of what I can do to elevate their learning experience. So initially, I did a lot of project-based learning. So it's a lot of projects. The kids learn to collaborate with one another, uh, practice problem solving, uh, you know, communicate, 
and also 21st century learning. So these were the two elements. I tried to make every lesson that we had an experience mm. instead of just writing something from the whiteboard or opening to a chapter in the book. So I, I think in my practice, one of the things that I'm very proud of is this, how I incorporate my everyday lessons, you know, projects, 21st century learning, proper classroom assessment. I assessed how they were communicating with one another, how they were working with one another. I took a lot of notes. I studied them and tried to improve my practice as we went on. So we were doing exceptionally for the first two years. But when we were doing exceptionally, of course, my expectations grew. And I knew I can't have a lot of expectations because we were lacking infrastructure. I, I felt that I felt that we needed that leap, that, that something extra. And I also felt that it was unfair because I went to some urban schools and they were well equipped. And I was like, how can my children not have any of this, any of this infrastructure? So I took it on myself. I said, well, you know what? If nobody's going to get it for them, let's go get it, you know? So what I did was uh, with the help of Give.my, it was a crowdfunding platform back then. We collected funds. Initially, I was expecting only 2,000 to 3,000 ringgit. Long mm. story short, we collected almost 13,000 ringgit. Wow. wow. Yeah. And we, I went crazy with the money. I just, you know what? Anything that is old. I, I wanted my kids to have the same resources, the same facilities, the same infrastructure, the same learning experience as they would get in one of the best schools in Malaysia. So I went all out, you know, we renovated the classrooms, did all the wiring, did the floors, did the walls, the roofs, got each child in that classroom. Uh, I had 25 tablets. Uh, we had computers in the classroom. So now the infrastructure was ready and I said, okay, now let's plan. So with that, with the foundation set, I started the uh, Asli EPAL, I call it a program. So the Asli EPAL program, the main focus of that program was this. Number one, it was to help them to write, to practice their writing skills. Because I saw that in the exams, they were tested. Uh, in one of the exam questions every year for the UPSR or for their year five, they will have a part of the uh, composition part of it where they have to write emails. Yeah. But I was like, you're writing emails on paper, but you've never written emails in real life. How does that make sense? You're not communicating with anyone. So bam, let's start an ETEL program. But I did not want them to um, write to children of their, of their own age. I wanted them to actually talk or write to professionals. Mm -hmm. So I, what I did was I put, put out a social media campaign, a social media poster online, and I called for volunteers. I said I wanted 20 to 25 volunteers and... Uh, Thankfully, 50 volunteers showed up <laughs> and uh, uh, the commitment was they, I would pair them with one child each and they would have to write to them once a week at least. Mm. So we had professionals who were, who were doctors, who were journalists, who were researchers, who were lawyers. So what I'm also trying to do was to expose them to what's out there. What would happen if you stay in this path? What kind of potential you can see in yourself? So what I intentionally did was when I saw that was there was a kid who was really good with drawing stuff, I paired him with an architect. There was another girl who was really good in math, I paired her with, a, with an accountant. So they had something in common. Right, right. That's a reason and, why you're learning all this and why you're good at it. Right. And a lot of them also, a few of them, not a lot of them, I think about uh, out of the 25, seven of them were actually not from Malaysia. They were either Malaysians who were overseas or... Uh, Two of them were from the UK and another was from Australia. So we had that exposure as well. So they, was, they started talking. So initially, they were talking about, you know, writing about normal stuff, you know, because we were really poor. The kids were really poor. We did not have proper sentence structures. But to keep the long story short, uh, short they learned from the experience. They learned by imitating what the, the, uh, the volunteers were writing about. And it created a reverse psychology. Instead of me chasing after them to write something, they were chasing after me because they were like, sir, where is the email? You right. Get it? So they are looking, they are looking forward to it. It's not me. And uh, at that time, I remember that uh, internet connection was really bad. This was uh, 2016. It, it, it was okay, but it was bad. We had connection, I think it was H+. So uh, it wasn't good enough. So what I had to do is I had to collect all the tablets, go home, individually open each tablet on, you know, one by one, send the email, send the email. 
I think it's a labor of love. Uh, but as soon as the kids got to the end of the year or year and a half of actually going through that program with the volunteers, their their worldview expanded. They were talking about things that I never expected before. Can you imagine an orang asli child who had trouble writing in the first month that she was with me? At the end of a year and a half, was talking about the different regions of Africa with wow. someone who was yeah. So it's like I was like okay, blown away. So, so you were mind, more mind blown than they were. I was mind blown. You see, they were like teaching me like, wow, what are you guys doing? I wasn't expecting this. I never knew that that was the power of motivation. When someone wanted to do something and someone really likes doing it, they would do it. They would yeah. find out a way to do it. And okay, so that's the sorry. The story goes. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. It's I love story. that story. <laughs> yeah, you're a great storyteller. Oh my god. That's yeah. So, good. so uh, I'm the, so touched. I'm almost in tears. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, if I knew you guys sooner, probably I'll just pad you up with one of the kids. And then, oh, yeah, nice! I would, yeah. <laughs> would love that. Yeah, we yeah. can still do it. Yeah, we would. Yeah, for so your the, new students. The, after the EPAL project, um, so I knew I needed to do more. You know, uh, whatever I was doing in the classroom at that time was not enough. You know, with that project based learning, I knew I needed to do more. And the the kids actually made it easier for me because um, I think once they they had the autonomy, they knew what they were doing, what I expected to do. I remember very clearly initially when I told them to get into groups, no idea what, what we were doing and all that. So progress really well. We started doing. Um, uh, I used to play music when I was younger, hmm. and I still play music, but not that often anymore. I play the guitar. So I thought, you know what, I have the skill, and I would be selfish if I didn't teach it to them. You know. So I wanted it to be a learning experience instead of creating a band, because as, as someone who used to perform. Creating, a, I mean, being in a band is not fun. It's stressful, you know, yeah. because your intention is perfection mm. to get it to the note. Because it's work. Time. Exactly, <laughs> it's work. You're performing. You are judged by. It. You're not. But jamming is cool. Yeah. Jamming is fun. You know, you just get to let loose and all that. So I just wanted them to enjoy, and so I got together with some of my friends. We got them ukuleles and the kids, and we jam almost every day. Uh, I initially wanted to go with the oldies, like you know, the songs that have meaning, you know, like Westlife, something, something like that. But they, oldie, they... Westlife is an oldie <laughs> for, us, like, for them, uh, yeah, for, for kids, them, like for kids, them, right, for yeah. them, because yeah. they're kids, yeah. But they didn't like it; they hated it. They wanted upbeat songs, so I was like, okay, let's do Jason Mraz, <laughs> right, right. let's do Maroon Five, and we also did rock numbers like. Um, uh, The cranberries, you know, zombie and all that. Yeah, right. so they love those kind of songs. So, so that was another project, and uh, I also did a poetry based project where I got volunteers, uh, amateur poets, to actually write uh, poems that related to their livelihoods. I realized that in the syllabus that we had uh, for the year five at that time, we had poems, but it had nothing to do with their livelihood. So there was that disconnection. We were talking about winter and yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean it's it's good to expose them, but for someone who wants to learn something, it has to be something that they can relate to. Yes, once they have already learned the language, they are really good with reading and all that, and then you can expose winter lah, desert lah, whatever. It's 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 fine, you know. So I wanted something that related to their livelihood. So I got volunteers to write that, and the last project that uh intervention project that I did was something called Skola Poko. Uh, I realized that I needed to do this was for three reasons. First of all. A lot of the kids were actually waiting to join me in my classroom, but I only can teach three classes a year. That's the maximum, uh, which means there are other classes who can't join me. So they'll be waiting. When are we going to join Mr. Sam's class? Okay, maybe in year four. So they'll be scheming among themselves. Uh, and usually, when we are having our fun lessons in the classroom, you will have eyes around the classroom just looking. Like, no, oh, poor thing. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, you know, I had to. I I I should do something. And I realized, you know, I told you guys about the dropout issues, the yeah. uh, the attendance problems. Uh, the students in my classroom, the attendance was always good, and I knew I had to do something about that as well. And that was the last fact. I told you there were three things, right? The third thing was I wanted to incorporate the element of nature into their learning. It was something that I had planned for a long time, but I just didn't have the time to actually get it done. So I said, you know what? Let's do this. So what I did was I uh, actually designed uh, 
a, a plan to actually provide uh, learning in the outdoors where we incorporated technology, we incorporated music and we incorporated environment as well. Uh, mostly environmental conservations and all that. So what we do, I, I pick two spots in the kampong where the children uh, from that areas, one of it is quite deep in the inside. So most of them who don't come to school are from there. Mm. So I said, okay, let's do one there and let's do one in another spot. So we started off with five to 10 children, you know, just having fun. Uh, and uh, in a month, the numbers quickly jumped. It was 10, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 in one location. So in two locations, there's like 100 other kids that I'm teaching. And also it provided the opportunity for the kids that I have already taught in my classroom, uh, who already know how to play the ukulele, who already know how to use the tablet, who already know how to communicate well to teach the other kids as right, well. So right. I started creating mini yeah, yeah. Samuels. Uh, <laughs> and and, and we, were, we, we were having fun. So, uh, Bell and uh, JD, if you guys can imagine the learning experience or the learning environment that I tried to create for something like this. In my class, you could see at one corner, there'll be a few kids writing emails to their, to their pen pals. In another corner, there'll be a few kids with the ukulele just jamming and practicing their songs. In another corner, you have two kids speaking to another one another poems that we have created for them. We're not practicing with one another. On the other side of the room, uh, in the afternoon or something like that, we are going out in the outdoor. So I wanted to create that experience. On top of that, my classroom teaching and learning goes on as usual. Yes, it was a lot of work. And that's why I did a lot of this gradually. Mm -hmm. uh, I admit, you know, when I practiced uh, one element or one innovation, I perfected it. I, I experimented with it to suit the needs of my children. And then, okay, let's look at what other things that we can solve. Because to me, I couldn't ignore the problems. Mm. Uh, when my children couldn't read, I was like, you know what? We've got to do something about this. We can't just let it be. Not nobody was just, nobody was going to do anything about it. Is this the Sekolah Pokok and After School program that you just designed on your own? A lot of these programs that I do, except uh, the EPAL program of which I can actually incorporate to every, into everyday lessons because it's basically writing. A lot of the other programs is after school. Mm. So after classes, uh, the kids would willingly stay back, and, right. and uh, they they love to be in the classroom in the in the place. I think we also created a sense of uh, that that was our safe space. We took care of the classroom together. I'm not the kind of teacher who instructs kids to go and sweep the floor. I sweep it with them. Uh, it's our place instead of you know. Yeah, that 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 was some, that is something that I really miss. I remember the last day that I was uh, at the at my class. You know, I actually took some time before I left for New York. You know, the kids all left. I just did my. I usually do every Friday evenings after everybody has left. I do a proper cleaning of the whole classroom. Um, if you guys have seen it in the pictures before, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So like mop it, everything, sweep, arrange the table, arrange the chairs, make sure it's really good. And I did that for the last time. I was like, oh gosh, this all, when can I do this again? <laughs> but fortunately, uh, the pandemic has actually brought me back. So actually been uh, going to the school um, twice a week. Oh, right now. oh yep. okay. I'm um, helping the kids uh, because the when school was closed for three months, uh, it took a toll on their learning. Uh, you see, this is where we need more infrastructure for indigenous school, uh, yeah. schools and connectivity. Though we had, okay, connectivity was okay. Uh, a lot of teachers were actually uh, resorting to use to use WhatsApp and Telegram to send in questions. But that's not learning. That's just basically doing the bare minimum. You know, there's no assessment. I can't see them. We can't do a video call. We can't do anything together and their parents can't help them as well a lot of them do probably had uh, three or four years of school and they can read but they can't help them to the extent where you know get help the kids with their homework and all that so they need that assistance so the three months was a huge blow uh, not only to their not only did their level or their performance drop their the school attendance suffered terribly so uh, enthusiasm spoke, dropped right yeah yep. yeah yeah and uh, because of that, I, I spoke to my uh, headmistress. I said, you know what? If you let me come back, I would. So she said, okay, this is your home. So I was like, all right, let's do this. Wow. So, so you're start... doing your master's 
And you're you're still doing the after school program with the kid now. Yep, <laughs> but wow. I only I only do it I only can do it twice a week, um, mainly because uh because of the distance and all that, and uh, I only can spend a very limited amount of hours with them. So how yeah. far is it? How long do you have to travel to see them? Okay, the school. If, if any of you have been to Kuantan before, right? Yes, uh, we've been so to Kuantan. You've been to Kuantan. Okay, uh, so Kuantan to Segamat. Do you know where Segamat is? Yeah, yeah. Segamat is, Segama is Johor. Johor, isn't it? Right, yeah. it's Johor. Yeah. So we are heading south from Kuantan. We are heading south. So as you are he- heading south, the the town that you were, the small town that you will reach before Segamat is Muazamsha, and my school is before in in the middle lah, in just before the town. So from Kuantan, it is about. 95 kilometers from the place that I'm staying. From that town, that small town is about 50 plus kilometers. Uh, so I made a decision to travel. This is my own by my own decision to travel because I have family commitments and uh, it just made a lot of sense for me to travel back then. But of course, 100 kilometers, one one way, two ways, like 200 kilometers for eight years. Yep, that's a lot of kilometers. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, but, but it was all worth it, lah. I, 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 I never felt that it was, it was forced or anything. So mm. I think that made the difference, lah. So if, if you're, some, yeah. you're, you're not te- you're teaching, but from what I hear, you're empowering these kids to be who they can be. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think that potential. Was, that was my, yeah, yeah, that was my intention that as well. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you know, yeah, sorry. Uh, we all know that <laughs> teachers are. Supposed to impart knowledge to their mm. students, but how much heart and soul is needed to be able to connect to your students like you have? Right, I think um, that's that what makes uh, that that makes teaching a very very hard job. It's very tough, you know. I I have a lot of friends who have kids and they don't even want to teach their kids, their only kids, you know. <laughs> like yo, it's your own kids, man. Yeah. And the thing is, we are expected to be professionals. As in knowing methodologies, correct methodologies to be applied in the classroom as well. But at the same time, we require love, passion, and patience. And to get this combination right, I, it's very tough. You know, mm. you have a bad day and all that. You can't take it out on the kids. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a lot to expect from teachers. So teaching is a very tough job. If somebody was coming to tell me like. Actually, somebody just texted me. Uh, you know, once the uh, the story about me went around, uh, somebody texted me a few days ago. I just had the chance to reply to this individual and ask me about whether uh, he should continue with teaching or not because he had an experience. And I said, yes, but you have to look at the long run. You know, passion. You know, you know. Some people feel like they can teach because they went. I went and taught in this refugee school for a month, and it was fun. No, try doing it for a year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's 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 a very different. It's a lifelong experience. thing in many ways, mm. right? Yes. Yeah. Mentally exhausting as well, and that is why I believe if there is no passion and no love for the job, it's it is one of the worst jobs to be in. And it, so, so, yeah. would, and it, would it doesn't say, pay well as well. Uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. Would you say you understand why some teachers, especially the older ones, when we were kids going to school, you understand why some teachers were not as Passionate about the job as well, because now do you understand that a bit more? Because it is that mentally tiring. I do, and I also feel. But if you're comparing to back then, those days teaching was different. It, it was like a very taskmaster thing where yeah. corporal punishment was a must. If you didn't get punished or whacked by your teacher, you did not learn. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a different perspective back then. Teachers are expected. If I were to do, if I was a teacher back then, I was doing right now. People call me crazy, you know. Yeah. So what's this ukulele it, shit? <laughs> are you teaching music or are you teaching English? They don't yeah. get it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Mm. So uh, it's a different perspective. But for teachers nowadays, uh, and that's why I think a lot of teachers are actually either wanting to quit or are in the job. Physically, but their heart and soul is just not there anymore. Mm. Yeah, they're just in the job for the sake of doing the job. Mm. So, what is your message to all teachers then, who who want to be able to connect to their students like you have? I don't have a message for teachers, but I really think teachers across Malaysia and across the world actually they need help. The more in what way? 
Yeah. It's, I think they need support. In, in Malaysia, for example, uh, teachers are also burdened down with other jobs as well. Like for me, I'm not just an English teacher. I am the data teacher as well. So I take care of the whole school's data, oh. the assets of the school, yes. So oh, I need okay. to know how many tables are there. I need to keep the files. I need to have... So there's a lot of things that teach. Yep. You do. <laughs> that's a, we do that as well. And yeah. then when, when, when in sports, what we do is we, you know, that garisan padang and all that. Yeah, yeah. Who does it? You do it as well. Yeah, you just do it as well. So that's the thing. Uh, the expectations are really high for teachers. And I think if teachers are actually not given, ex- we should not give teachers an excuse. If you look at it as a professional job, that seven hours, we got to make sure that the seven to eight hours that a teacher is with uh, the classroom, it's maximized towards teaching. I know this This has a lot of implications, you know, like cost-wise, economy-wise, how much is the finance ministry able to fork out for teacher assistance and all that. But if we want quality, that's a must. Another thing would be the number of students in the classroom. I think I was blessed. I am blessed. Though indigenous schools, we have different challenges, but I had a good number of students to work with in the classroom. The number of students in, children in the classroom, in my classroom, never exceeded 25. So that was a comfortable number to work with for me. You know, if I wanted them to move in groups or to pair with each other, I could still, uh, you know, observe each group doing their thing, you know, give feedback a little, uh, you know, nudge them a bit. Okay, you need to do this. And then jump to the other group. But if there's 40 kids in the classroom, 45, that's just insane. Mm. You know, that's insane. And probably that's one of the reasons why teachers would actually go back to the usual method okay there's just 45 of you i got no time for this kids got different attitudes as well one will be screaming one yeah. will be jumping yeah. so yeah. it's a tough tough job because they burn out exactly i i mm. pity my teacher last time i have to deal with with a <laughs> student like me in the class my god <laughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> yeah. now um sam um lastly do you have any advice for us as as you know regular malaysians about helping out in the Orang Asli community. How can we as Malaysians help out the Orang Asli community? I think we need to keep our eyes open, uh, our, our, our hearts open as well to the plight of this community. Um, they have been, in, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think they have been put at the backseat for way too long. Uh, a lot of policies are made at the expense of them. A lot of policies for, are done for them, but not with them as well their culture, their identity, their livelihoods, their voices have not been given any sense of importance. A lot of times, uh, even when policies or decisions are being made uh, with regards to the Orang Asli people, it's usually as a token, you know? Like you have like a Netflix series, you have like three white guys, one Asian guy, one black guy, just to go makan, you know? <laughs> it shouldn't be that way. We need to be actively engaging them. We need to listen to them. I think one of the... Uh, one of the secrets to my to what I've been able to do with my kids is to listen. You know, is to listen. We open our hearts. They have got lots to teach us. They've got lots to teach us. They've got lots to tell us. So we need to listen. I also hope that, uh, you know, with, with policies uh, uh, being designed uh, or with the budget or whatever it is, that we put the community and their culture at the forefront of our national identity. I've never learned about the Orang Asli when I was in school. Mm. I was just having breakfast earlier today and um, there was this uh, young guy who was actually, you know, the boss's son of this restaurant. Uh, so he was talking to me about what I was doing. He finally found out who I am after seeing what happened online. Mm. And he was asking me, I was talking to him and he said, you know what, bro, I never knew there was there were specific schools for all Asli people. And I was like, whoa. Okay, yeah, and I only I thought there was only one type of Orang Asli people. No, there were plenty. We don't know. Mm. They are somehow not part of our national identity, and I hope we work towards that. You know, we, we definitely need to work towards that. Yeah. Well, thank That's you great. so much, Samuel, for all that you do, and we wish you all the best. We really, really hope and pray that you will win this and <laughs> and do more for for the for your children. I think this is just yeah. the beginning. Uh, it only implies that I've got more to do. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I think I'm, I'm for the cause, I'm in the cause. Uh, and I feel that uh, if my intentions are right and my focus, uh, my focus is true, my heart is right and my heart is true, uh, I'll just try my best 
for as long as I can. And we'll see what works for them, you know. Well, Samuel, so I'll tell you what. Your, yeah. Yeah. So after your master's degree, are you going to come back to that yeah. school again? Yes. Uh, okay, to that yeah. school, I'm not so sure. Because the thing is, uh, I will have to report back to the Ministry of Education. Ah, okay. So that depends. One of the main reasons, if you see I have time actually, one of the main reasons actually that I applied for my master's, uh, a lot of my friends actually did their master's very early on. Like I told you, right? Uh, after a year, master's... Get it done fast, right? Yeah. 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 Bang, bang, bang. I didn't saw... Uh, I didn't see that uh, there was a purpose for me to do my master's. I wanted my master's to, to mean something. Mm. And that's why I tried my best to do the best that I can for my kids uh, until I hit the wall. And when I hit the wall, I knew that I've done all I can in the classroom with the community. I needed to learn more. And now is the time for my master's. And that is when I applied for an international scholarship to, to actually improve myself and see how I can contribute even at school level, at the ground, or even at a larger scale, I don't mind as long as you are giving back to the community.